Day students, it's class time. Watch lessons in real time on the Television Jamaica's YouTube channel or One Spot Media. We also are live on gojamaica.com. If you have questions on today's subjects, you can send them to the Television Jamaica's Facebook page at Television Jamaica or Instagram at Television underscore Jamaica or use the hashtag TVJ class time. I'm Melissa Beckford Simpson and I will be guiding you through Cape Caribbean studies. This week, we are going to be looking at the Caribbean historical processes. So here we are again. I'd like to begin today's lesson by reading an excerpt for you. It says, as very few of the Negroes can so far brook the loss of their liberty, and the hardships they endure. They are ever on the watch to take advantage of the least negligence in their oppressors. Insurrections are frequently the consequence, which are so seldom suppressed without much bloodshed. Sometimes these are successful, and the whole ship's company is cut off. They are likewise always ready to seize every opportunity for committing some act of desperation to free themselves from their miserable state, and they often succeed. These are the words penned by one slaver, yes? What does this tell you about resistance? Because we're, we're continuing with the historical process and the last time we spoke about resistance. And today we are going to be continuing with resistance. But what does it tell you? Here's what it tells me. It tells me that from the very moment that Africans were captured, they began to resist. And they resisted on board the ships as well. So they would jump overboard. And there was one particular instance when they were successful in taking over the entire ship. Yes, enslaving their enslavers and then sailing the ship where they wanted it to go. It did happen. Yes, so students, today we will be looking at the historical processes that have shaped contemporary Caribbean society and culture. We will be examining insurrectionary acts of resistance undertaken by the enslaved Africans. Last time we looked at non-insurrectionary actions. We will be highlighting the resistance methods after 1838. We will be explaining the major steps towards what we call political enfranchisement. And we will be also determining the extent to which these resistance methods have been important, an important feature in the development of the Caribbean. So let's get right into it. Now, if you recall, last time we defined insurrectionary. We are talking about armed resistance, resistance that caused harm to the enslavers, right? Now, these were usually planned, yes? Usually well planned, as opposed to non-insurrectionary. Sometimes the non-insurrectionary ones were just spur of the moment. All right, so nobody was looking, and they just do something to the machine to make it stop working. Yes, so it wasn't always planned, but these were usually planned. It was commonly done in groups, commonly, and the intent of it was usually to topple the entire system of enslavement. That was what they usually wanted under um, insurrectionary. So what are these examples we're talking about now? Marinage, ever heard of that? Yes, rebellions poisoning of whites, burning of cane fields, and we are going to examine today the Haitian Revolution. I know you're there saying, so oh, this a teacher love Haiti, so everything should come with Haiti because it was very important what Haiti was able to achieve in 1791. All right, so let's start with the rebellions. When we talk about rebellions, we're talking about armed resistance of the enslaved people against their masters, all right? Now, historians like Beckers and Shepard have said that rebellions were very common. In fact, rebellions were a day-to-day -day matter across the British West Indies and across the West Indies in general. But somewhere towards the late 1700s, going into the 1800s, there was a there were a number of rebellions, right? So there was an increase in the number of rebellions that we saw, all right? 
It was common, as I said, throughout all the territories. And there usually was a strong leader or two that was involved. Somebody who was the head cook and buckle washer, as we call it in Jamaica, for this rebellion. Somebody who was usually um, in a privileged position sometimes and was able to do what was necessary to plan this rebellion. Somebody who commanded the respect of the rest of the enslaved people. It was usually planned for months and the whites lived in fear of their lives because of the ratio of blacks to whites. Now, <laughs> if I were there, I would, be, I would be sleeping with one eye open to, you know. Why were they doing this? Because in some territories, we had something called deficiency laws. And this was what defined the ratio of blacks to whites. But the deficiency laws were not always abided by because it meant that the planters needed to to pay more white persons to keep the ratio going. So in some cases, the deficiency law said that there needed to be uh, maybe one white person to every five, to every six. But in some cases, you had one white person to 25 Africans. No, wouldn't you sleep with one eye open if it was you? Yes. And I know you're asking, so if this was the case, why is it that the system lasted for so long and that the enslaved people did not just fight their way through and just, you know, throw off the system? It wasn't as simple as that because there was, in fact, strong control of the enslaved people throughout the West Indies. And this made it a little bit difficult. Not that they did not try. As I said, there was a rebellion almost daily, especially towards the end. So what are these rebellions we're talking about? You may have heard of some of them. The Tucky Rebellion of, of 1760 took place in my parish man, St. Mary, on the Escher Plantation. And this Tucky, he was very strategic. You know, he was there planning and planning for some time. And he was able to move in secret from plantation to plantation, organizing the enslaved people. And he nearly succeeded too, you know. My, my, my grandma would have said, nearly more succeed. Yes, man, because the, such was the planning. But then again, of course, the enslaved, the white people, had more weaponry, stronger weaponry. So what they did was they stormed the fort and they took out some, some guns and ammunition and they went on a rampage because their aim was to topple the system of enslavement. Then we have the Burbis Rebellion. No, this one, you know, some people find this one to be very funny because the Burbis Rebellion was actually very successful for almost an entire year. They were able to box the whites in, they were so afraid of their lives. And they basically took over the entire area of Burbis, which is now a part of Guyana. And they were able to live in freedom for just about a year. What do you think caused the failure of this one now, eventually? What usually caused it? Tell me what usually caused anything that is good to stop. Infighting. Jealousy, we say bad mind in a Jamaica. And so there was a little bit of that. There was a little bit of rivalry between two different factions and two different leaders. And so that was the end of that. They were, because of the infighting, they were not focused to sustain, and the whites were able to call in troops. And that was the end of that rebellion. That was 1763, by the way. Now, the Barbados Rebellion of 1816, this is one of what we call the Emancipation Revolts, those after 1800, because these became more intense as they went along. All right? The Busha Rebellion, also called the Busha Rebellion. And this one was kind of a knee-jerk reaction to the slave registration bill. But the, the, the enslaved people knew that something was wrong, you know. But they could not tell exactly. That was also the case with the Demerara Rebellion of 1823. It was a knee-jerk reaction to the amelioration proposals that were put forward by the British government to improve the system. The planters refused to implement these proposals. The enslaved people pick up, say something, no right? Because there were some of them who could read. And, and, and they, they, they rebelled. The Christmas Rebellion, 
also, there was, a, there was a lot of talk because by this time, emancipation was well on the way. It was, it, there, there was a lot of talk in Britain, a lot of writing in the newspapers, and a lot of, lot of this was coming down to the colonies. And so, the enslaved people who worked in the great house, you know, they were, they always behave as if them fool fool. Yes, but you ever hear the saying, play fool for catch wise? That's what they were doing. So while they were serving in the, 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 their, their, their enslavers, they were there listening to the conversation. They were there listening to the news that was coming from one pla plantation to the other. Right? And so they knew that something was up. Something was going on. And so they decided that since something had gone, and it looked like the planter them don't plan to free we up, we are going to free up ourselves. You know? And we know we're good at that in the Caribbean. Good at freeing up ourselves in many ways than one. All right. So let's just focus a little bit on the Christmas Rebellion here. Because the Christmas Rebellion is, is said to be the catalyst that allowed the Emancipation Act to be passed in 1833. Now, take note of the date I'm telling you, you know. The act was passed in 1833 in the British Parliament. It did not become effective until 1834, but there was a clause in the act that said that they would serve a period called apprenticeship all the way up to 1840. So full emancipation should not really not have come until 1840. But of course, it ended two years earlier, at 1838. So it was originally planned as a strike. And we are very familiar with Sam Sharp. He was a privileged slave. He, was, he, he did jobbing. He was in charge of, of the jobbing slaves, those who were skilled and would go to different plantations to do different work, right? And it was strategically timed. Yes, so they sat down and he said, mm -hmm, let's see how this go now. We're planning to strike. And we are going to demand wages of these enslavers. So they waited until Christmas time, man, and you know the saril drinking and the Christmas cake and everything, and the merriment was going on. But little did the planters know, you know, that the enslaved people were planning something, and they were there planning. They planned that after the Christmas holidays, they were not going to go back to work. They were going to tell their enslavers that we are not going to work until we are paid. We want to be wage earners. <laughs> Very ambitious, don't you think? But that is precisely what they plan to do. So Sam Sharp did not actually plan a rebellion. You know, he planned a strike. But this turned into a wide-scale rebellion. After, on the Kensington Plantation in St. James, something went awry on the morning when this was to be enacted. Something went awry, right? And the, plantation, the, 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 the enslaved on the plantation started to burn the cane fields, and that was the end of that. Before we knew it, the entire western Jamaica was burning down. So you had parishes, St. James, um, Trelawney, all of these parishes in the west. So we also call it the Western Liberation Uprising. It's also called Sam Sharp Rebellion. It's also called the Baptist War, because it is said that the Baptist Church was instrumental in this rebellion because Sam Sharp was in fact from the Baptist Church. Right? So here we have or um, we're able to see these pictures of how rebellions took place, you know, with all of the burning down of the cane fields and, and all of these things. All right, let's zero in just a little bit before we go to break on Sam Sharp. All right? As we said, he was privileged. He was killed. He owned his own home of the plantation. That is how much his master trusted him. He could also read, he was literate. And so he could read the newspapers. Sometimes the, the news was very old and stale. You know, it's not like now, you just take up your phone and you go on instant messaging and everything. It wasn't like that. So sometimes the news was old and stale, but at the same time, he was able to get this information. And he was the one who spread the information at the Sunday markets. When they go to market, you would spread the information, talk to different persons, and then you would get all of these different people, you know, to come on board. Now, we're going to pause right here. We're going to take a quick break, and we soon come back to talk some more about the historical process. Stay with us. It's here. Interactive classes for all ages on the School Time channel on OneSpotMedia.com. 
with a combination of live Zoom classes and recorded class time, schools not out lessons, and numerous educational content. We've created a comprehensive 24-hour channel dedicated exclusively to educating our nation's youth. Early childhood through to primary, secondary and tertiary, it's one stop on one spot for education, 24 hours. Brought to you by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information in association with Television Jamaica Limited. Reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it. Avoid close contact with anyone with the cold or flu-like symptoms. If you become ill, please visit your doctor or the nearest health center and share your travel history. The flu and coronavirus can kill. Let's protect each other. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much. It's here. Interactive classes for all ages on the School Time channel on onespotmedia.com. With a combination of live Zoom classes and recorded class time, schools not out lessons, and numerous educational content, we've created a comprehensive 24-hour channel dedicated exclusively to educating our nation's youth. Early childhood through to primary, secondary and tertiary, it's one stop on one spot for education, 24 hours. Brought to you by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information in association with Television Jamaica Limited. Welcome back, students. We have been discussing rebellions and their success. So I want to ask you this question, you at home. Why were rebellions not as successful? What's your take on that? Why were they not as successful as they could have been, especially in some of the ones that we just looked at? See if you can figure that out. All right, so what are we looking at here? Mm -hmm. We're going to be talking about marinage. And marinage is one of the major ways that the enslaved resisted. All right. So listen to this ad now. This is an ad, you know. This is an ad. Run away from the subscriber about five weeks ago, a Negro boy named Jack, about 15 or 16 years of age, and has no brand mark. He speaks tolerable good English, and it is supposed that he has taken the Clorindon Road, being well acquainted in that parish. Two pounds, 15 shillings reward will be given for taking him up and lodging him in any of the goals of the island, giving information thereof. And the owner there is Andrew Byrne. Uh, this was very, very common, very common ads like these because they were constantly running away. Yes. Now, running away is one thing. You just get up and run away by yourself. 
you know, but then there is marinage, which is a, a little bit different, you know, and it is the establishment of independent communities by Africans who were enslaved, who were enslaved, and it's usually in the hilly or mountainous areas of the territories. So anywhere there were mountains, there were hills, then there, was, there were maroon communities. The original word is Spanish, which is Cimarron, because it came from the maroons in Hispaniola, the first grouping. And then there were others now in Jamaica, Cuba, Guyana, Suriname, as I said, anywhere across the West Indies where there was mountainous terrain. Now, we do have a group of maroons in Suriname that are called the Bush Negroes. Yes, and they're still there. They still uh, are autonomous to some extent and they still live within their communities. Let's focus a little bit on the Jamaican ones though. We had two groupings, the Leeward and the Windward Maroons. And we have had two Maroon Wars and a treaty. Mm -hmm. How that go now? All right, so let's look at this map right here. If you examine it, you'd notice that, the, that a number of Maroon communities are highlighted some of which still exist. So you have over this side to the western side, you have the Akompong, Akompong town, Trelawney town, right? And then to the eastern side, you have Scottsall in St. Mary, Charlestown in Portland, Moore town, Nanny town. Some of these areas have been ab abandoned and some still exist um, right now. For example, the Charlestown Maroons, very lively group. Very interesting group, yes. You should take a trip there and just, you know, immerse yourself in their culture. And so are the Akompong Maroons. Very, very interesting. All right. So let's look at the Treaty of Pacification. What is it? Signed in 1739. How did we get to a treaty? No, you tell me. If, we, if we're getting to a treaty, it means that we're at a place where we are sitting down and talking. Not true. That's what it means. So how did it come to the place that the Maroons were able to sit down and have this kind of discussion with the, with the whites, with the British, who supposedly own and run the island and were enslavers? It was the result, the treaty was the result of years of fighting between the whites and the maroons. That must mean something. So how were they fighting? Because they lived in the cockpit area, specifically the, the maroons at Trelawney Town and Akompong. They lived in the cockpit area. And anybody knows the cockpit area knows that it's karst topography and it is, it's very difficult. It's a very difficult terrain. And so the maroons were able to use the terrain as a cover, you know, using guerrilla war, warfare and ambushing tactics. So the, the whites would be coming up man and they would see the bush moving. And every time they look, the bush stop move. And then the, the bush is moving. <laughs> They are wondering how this is happening. Yes, so they used all of these tactics and they had very good leaders as well in the form of Kojo, Nani, and so on. So the treaty, in the name of God, amen. Whereas Captain Kojo, Captain Akompong, Captain Johnny, Captain Kofi, Captain Kwaku, and several other Negroes. Their dependents and adherents have been in a state of war and hostility for several years past against our sovereign Lord, the King, and the inhabitants of this island. First, that all hostilities shall cease on both sides forever. Secondly, that the said Captain Kojo, the rest of his captains, adherents, and men shall forever hereafter in a perfect state of freedom and liberty. And it goes on to tell you that they were granted 600 hectares of land in the same cockpit area and that they were supposed to be free, you know, provided that they did some things for the, for the British, of course. So we don't want to go too much into that now. Now, there were some fierce maroon leaders and fierce leaders overall, and history is sometimes not very kind to the women, but we know of none of the maroons. Those, some of the information that we do know is a little bit mythical, of course, you know, some of those things could not really happen. And then we have Nanny Grig of Barbados, who was also a fierce female leader during enslavement, all right? And so you had females coming up, and it is even said by some historians that females had more opportunity and 
carried out resistance tactics and they were also leaders in their own right. So it wasn't just men alone. All right, so here we have some pictures of Maroon communities. And this is the peace cave. And this was where the treaty was said to be signed between Captain Kojo and the captain of the British Army in Jamaica. Their bang here is used, very important symbol. They use it to call and to give information to the community. And there's, there's a special way to blow it and so on. All right, and celebrations. Celebrations during January when they have their, 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 their commemoration of the signing of the Treaty of Pacification in a compound town. You should try it out. You should go there one at a time, man. It's really nice music, you know, Jamaican music and everything. It's really, really good. A very rich part of our history. So the Maroons still maintain today as an important symbol of resistance. You ever hear them say, you have nanny blood is something I love to say. You have nanny blood. Yes, man, that's me. Resistance is in my blood. And it seems to be in all of our blood because we continue to resist, it. resist even times when we don't need to resist, you know, when we need to conform. The Haitian Revolution, very quickly, because we have so another aspect of the historical process to look at. All right, so in 1791, there was this huge rebellion that turned out to be a revolution and the only one of its kind in the West Indies, all right? So the original leader was a runaway from Jamaica, Bookman, yes? And he was the one who strategically planned with other enslaved people to resist. And they used a very strategic timing, you know, because the French Revolution was going on at this time. It started in 1789. And so did a colored revolt against the whites on the island um, and in the territory called Haiti, the section called Sondermore at the time. All right? Influenced by the Maroons of Jamaica because it was round about the same time that the Maroons were fighting and they were successful. So they were influenced. The Africans achieved their emancipation and independence at its end. Now, that is the most important thing out of it. So it was years of fighting and going through different leaders, all right? Most notable, Toussaint Louverture. We must have heard of Toussaint. Toussaint organized them into a very formidable fighting force because he himself was trained as a fighter. And so he organized them into this fighting group and took them almost to the end. Dessaline was the one who took them to the very end. And in 1804, they were able to declare themselves independent, albeit with all kinds of conditions. Embargoes were placed on them by, by, by the French and others. And they also had to pay back a massive amount of money in order to secure their own freedom, but they could say at that point that they did. And so we owe a lot to Haiti because the same Christmas rebellion we spoke about earlier, 1831, notice the timing, the same Christmas rebellion was also influenced heavily by the success of the Haitian revolution. And Haiti stands out today as the first independent black country in the world. They were able to throw off their enslavers, not just to talk about it and to try at it, but they were very, very successful. All right? So, in 1838, having said all that in the British West Indies, the Emancipation Proclamation was read. Yes? August morning, we call it. And everybody was in the Spanish Town Square listening to the reading. Yes? Be it enacted that all and every one of the persons who on the first day of August 1834 shall be holden in slavery within such British colony as aforesaid shall upon and from and after the said first day of August 1834 become and be to all intents and purposes free and discharged from all manner of slavery and shall be absolutely and forever manumitted. Yes, these were the words that were read. So, but, so, so, yeah, slavery done. It done now. They've read the proclamation. So why we have another rebellion up here? Why are we still rebelling? Why? 
Because when slavery ended, it did not mean that everything was well, that all their conditions and grievances and that they were put up in big houses and they were all given land and they were all fine. It didn't mean that. It was far from the truth. They were just given the free papers and said, go, be free. You know, as if we can eat freedom. Go, be free. So it was led by Paul Bogle in 1865 because the conditions were not changed, right? We know the end of the Morant Bay Rebellion. Big march to Spanish, to Spanish town. The governor never, li governor never listened to them. They march go back to St. Thomas. And there they stormed the vestry meeting and it turned out to be a rebellion. So the, the governor used strong measures after that, using some of the same maroons too, yes, called out martial law, end result of which over 500 people were just rounded up and were hanged and thrown in a mass grave at the back of the courthouse. The courthouse was burnt down, by the way, in the entire melee. And so what we have was a change from the old representative system to crown colony government. Two of our national heroes died there, even though George William Gordon was actually not responsible. And so when we say heritage time in October, this is precisely what we celebrate. All right, so we go to the road to political enfranchisement now, and there's something I want you to listen to. I want you to pay close attention to it. So let me have you stand at attention now in your living rooms as we watch and listen. But once in the history of a people, at three minutes to midnight, the flag of Jamaica is borne into the arena by runners of the Boys Brigade and received by the Prime Minister, who hands it to a warrant officer of the Jamaica Defence Force. His Excellency the Governor and the Prime Minister take up their positions facing the Royal Box. over Jamaica for the past three centuries is about to be replaced by the Jamaica national flag, heralding the birth of the new nation. The lights go out. The Union Jack is lowered and the new flag of Jamaica raised. Eternal Father, bless our land. Teach us true respect for all. What a beautiful way to start a new nation. I just love the words of the national anthem, don't you? I think it is absolutely one of the best written anthems in the entire world. Yes, yes, I'm patriotic like that to the anthem. I think it's beautiful. But how did we get there? That is all of 1962 before that was done. So how did we get there? 
we stopped at somewhere about 1865 with the Morant Bay Rebellion. So there must be something in the middle there that we need to look at to say, how did we get to independence? So we fast forward from 1865 to the 1930s across the Caribbean. And we look at the same issues coming back 100 years after emancipation, the same issues remained. The same economic and social conditions, the same little huts that they lived in on the plantations were almost what they were still living in. Yes, they were still fighting to find employment. There was still no proper education system in place for the former enslaved peoples. Yes, and so even the working conditions that they were under remained almost the same 100 years after. So we had a series of riots and strikes across the entire Caribbean beginning in St. Kitts. At that time, there were no legal or active trade unions. And we saw emerging out of this Caribbean leaders, trade unionists, who then became the same Caribbean early politicians. So. British government saw that all of this was happening, everybody was rioting. So what's the cause of this? They sent in a commissioner to see what was happening. And he was supposed to examine the social and economic conditions in the islands and to say what was the root cause of all of this unrest. They could not have this unrest happening. All right. So let's look at some of the Caribbean leaders. Because you see, out of the Moyen Commission that we just looked at, there were a number of things. The same things I just mentioned to you, conditions were exactly the same. Nothing had changed. There was no improvement of the lot of the thousands of freed blacks across the Caribbean. So you had these Caribbean leaders coming out now, yes? First, just because of the workers' rights, the issues, you know? So things like maternity leave never exists, you know? And if you chop off your hand on a machine, <clears throat> well, oh, so be it. You know, those things never existed. So we had these Caribbean leaders now, Hubert Critchlow, Grantley Adams, our very own Buster Manti, who came back to Jamaica almost to retire. Yes, after living his life in, in Panama, in Cuba, and so on, coming back to settle down with a little business. And these were the issues that were confronting him. All right, Arthur Cipriani of Trinidad. We are also looking at Uriah Butler and Norman Manley, our very own there again. Educated, yes, but very cognizant of the issues that were, we were facing in the Caribbean. And then now, all of these leaders, they began to agitate for change and also for trade unions. So we had the first trade unions coming up at this time, as well as the first set of political parties in the Caribbean. Yes. So in 1944, we had universal adult suffrage. So everybody over the age of 21, in some cases, could vote. So what did that mean? That meant that we were well on our way to governing ourselves, political enfranchisement. So here we have it. Internal self-government was the next step. All right, so it was a semi-autonomous state. We were still a colony of Britain, but there was a premier now instead of a governor or whatever abided under the Crown Colony government. There was a premier, and Norman Manley was one of our premiers, our first premier. Um, we now could have elections because there were no political parties that were formed coming out of the same trade uni unionism out of the 1930s riots. So elections were the next thing. Active political parties, the PNP and the JLP and the Barbados Progressive League and so on, you had all of these uh, political parties now coming together. And so the regular normal person now had a chance to have a say but it never stopped there so because the British government was still a little bit reluctant to just let things go. But there was a movement called decolonization and so it was inevitable. So our next stop was federation, right? And this meant that we were going to come together as a grouping to see if we could find our way from there. 10 Caribbean territories signed this agreement and this federation lasted, hmm, you guess how long it lasted. 
it failed, obviously, because inadequate financing. Everybody had an issue or a discontent, particularly Jamaica and Trinidad, because we were the largest and footing 70% of the bill. And so Jamaica did not think it fair. Here we have it. All right? And so we were now on the road to independence because of the failure of federation. Eric Williams issued his famous mathematical equation. One from 10 equals not because Jamaica opted out. With the prompting of Alexander Bustamante, who was, who was the opposition leader at the time, Jamaica had what we call a referendum. And the question was, should we stay in the federation? It now benefit we. It is benefiting the others more than it's benefiting us. And so we decided, yes, we should leave. And we left the federation. Trinidad left after that. And that was the story. That is the full story of it. So we went into independence in 1962 for Jamaica and Trinidad and the other Caribbean countries followed suit after that. So essentially then, this is the road to our historical, this is our entire historical process summed up in a very, very small time. Next time on Class Time, we're gonna be looking at uh, Caribbean society and culture and make sure that you are here listening for Caribbean studies. So that's it for Caribbean studies for today. Up next, we have CSEC Agricultural Stands. Stay with us and see you next time. Here, interactive classes for all ages on the School Time channel on OneSpotMedia.com. With a combination of live Zoom classes and recorded class time, schools not out lessons, and numerous educational content, we've created a comprehensive 24-hour channel dedicated exclusively to educating our nation's youth. Early childhood through to primary, secondary and tertiary, it's one stop on one spot for education, 24 hours. Brought to you by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information in association with Television Jamaica Limited.